There are several accounts of miracles performed by Jesus in the Bible. Many of them are truly spectacular. Jesus was not only able to heal people, but he also fed them and quenched their thirst. And even when things seemed hopeless, Jesus was able to bring people back from the dead. Yes, Jesus Christ performed many miracles. In this video you will know every miracle performed by the Son of God reported in the Bible. Welcome to Mysteries of the Unknown. Turning water into wine. One of Jesus' best known miracles, which even non Christians are probably familiar with, is also his first public miracle, turning water into wine at the wedding feast in Cana. Despite its great fame, this miracle is only recorded in the Gospel of John, specifically in John 2, from 1 to 11, when a wedding to which Jesus and his disciples were invited runs out of wine. Jesus' mother, Mary, also present at the wedding, asks Jesus for help, who had not yet revealed his divine nature. And after his mother's insistence, Jesus reluctantly agrees. But how much water was turned into wine exactly? In John 2, from 1 to 11, it says that there were six jars of water that were available so that the guests could clean themselves. Each contained between 75 and 113 liters, which were, through Jesus' miracle, filled with wine considered to be of much higher quality than what the groom had brought to serve at the party. Everyone was impressed, especially his disciples, who were finally able to witness Jesus' powers. Jesus performed this miracle to satisfy his mother and save the host of the feast from the shame of having nothing to serve his guests but it also served to display his glory so that his disciples could believe in his power over nature. Jesus' miracles were never meant to get attention. They always revealed a greater truth. Healing Sick Most of Jesus' miracles have to do with healing the sick, as a demonstration of his great compassion for human suffering. Some of these miracles prove his divine authority, but some were done simply out of mercy on those who suffered. He also healed people at the request of a loved one, as when he healed the very sick son of an official in Capernaum, mentioned in John 4, from 43 to 54, or when he healed the mother-in-law of his disciple Simon Peter when she had a fever, quoted in Matthew 8, 14 to 15, Mark 1, from 29 to 31, and Luke 4, 38-39. But the Gospels also show him healing large crowds of people who came to him in search of relief from their sufferings, as mentioned in Matthew 8, 16-17, Mark 1, from 32-34, and Luke 4, 40-41. So great was his healing power that even those who touched his cloak were healed, as quoted in Matthew 14 from 34 to 36, and Mark 6, from 53 to 56. One disease that Jesus heals more than once in the Bible is leprosy. This condition was not only very common at that time, but also represented those who were excluded from society, as it was highly contagious. Jesus' willingness to help lepers shows the depth of his compassion. He healed a man who came to him, as quoted in Matthew 8, 1-4, Mark 1, 40-45, and Luke 5, 12-14, and up to 10 at once, shown in Luke 17, from 11-19. Casting out evil spirits Closely associated with Jesus' healing miracles is the casting out of evil spirits. 
it was said at that time that demons and evil spirits caused physical and mental illness in people, and casting them out brought great relief to those who suffered from this possession. The acts of casting out demons showed Jesus' power and authority over the supernatural world. When Jesus encounters a demon-possessed man in Capernaum, even the demon is forced to confess Jesus' control over him, as seen in Mark 1, 21-27, and Luke 4, 31-38. Humanity and not just for the Jews, when he expelled a demon from the daughter of a Gentile woman, as shown in Matthew 15, from 21 to 28, and Mark 7, from 24 to 30. Causing a man to become blind and unable to speak, Jesus was accused by the Pharisees, who said that only those who are beside Beelzebub have the power to control demons. Jesus then leaves a great lesson, saying that every kingdom divided against itself will be brought to ruin, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand, as seen in Matthew 12, from 22 to 23, and Luke 11, from 14 to 23. Jesus made it clear to his disciples that even the smallest amount of faith would give them power over demons, passage quoted in Matthew 17, 14 to 20, Mark 9, 14 to 29, and Luke 9, 37 to 43. Probably the most famous account of Jesus casting out evil spirits is when he meets a man possessed by so many demons that they call themselves legion. The demons ask Jesus to send them into pigs instead of being tormented by heavenly power. When Jesus does what the demons ask, the animals run into the sea and drown. This was told in Matthew 8, from 28 to 33, Mark 5, from 1 to 20, and Luke 8, from 26 to 39. Making the Paralyzed Walk Again While the Gospels report that Jesus healed a large number of illnesses during his ministry, two of the most commonly cited are enabling the paralyzed to walk and the blind to see. In the case of the former, there are definitely multiple occurrences of this particular miracle recorded in the Gospels. The first of these healings occurs when a Roman centurion approaches Jesus and asks him to heal his servant, who is paralyzed in bed at home, as quoted in Matthew 8, from 5 to 13, and Luke 7, from 1 to 10. This encounter is notable for showing that Jesus came to heal both Gentiles and Jews as well as showing his power to heal people from a distance. Possibly the most famous example of Jesus making a paralyzed man walk is the story of the four boys who carried their quadriplegic friend on a mat and lowered him through a hole in the ceiling hoping that Jesus could heal him, described in Matthew 9, from 1 to 8, Mark 2, 1 to 12, and Luke 5, 17 to 26. This story is the source of Jesus' famous catchphrase, Rise, pick up your mat, and go home. Other examples of Jesus healing the palsy include the healing of a man from Bethesda, recounted in John 5, 1-15, and the healing of a woman in a synagogue, who had been handicapped for over 18 years. Woman, you are freed from your disease, said Jesus, in Luke 13, from 10-17. This miracle was on a Saturday day, which caused Jesus to gather more critics among the Pharisees. Making the Blind See Bringing sight to the blind, as we said before, is another health-related miracle that Jesus employed on several occasions. But healing the blind in the Bible means more than just literally giving people sight. The Gospel writers use the healing of the blind to illustrate the importance of faith, a spiritual trust in things unseen. The most famous account of the healing of a blind man is that of Bartimaeus, a blind beggar who is healed by the power of his own faith when he approaches Jesus for help, quoted in Matthew 20, from 29 to 34, Mark 10, from 46 to 53, and Luke 18, from 35 to 43.
Another healing occurs in Matthew 9, from 27 to 31, when Jesus heals not just one, but two different blind men who ask him to have mercy on them. According to your faith be it done, proclaim the Messiah. While in these encounters Jesus healed the blind simply by the power of his faith and his own words, the account in Mark 8, 22-26, shows Jesus employing a different method. When a blind man is brought to Jesus in the town of Bethsaida, Jesus responds by spitting in the blind man's eyes. He uses a similar method in John 9, 1-12, when he passes by a man blind from birth. Instead of spitting directly into the man's eyes, he spits in the dirt to make mud, which he rubs into the blind man's eyes. When he cleans himself of the mud, he can see for the first time in his life. Other Acts of Healing of Jesus While many of Jesus' healing miracles fall into broad categories such as blindness, paralysis, or leprosy, there are several of these miracles that are unique throughout his time on earth. Jesus' healings were not just about alleviating the physical pain of those he helped, but also served to show Jesus' authority over life in the natural world and his role as the Son of God. One such example is when he heals a man with a paralyzed hand, mentioned in Matthew 12, from 9 to 14, Mark 3, from 1 to 6, and Luke 6, from 6 to 11, also on a Saturday, in a synagogue, which is forbidden by the Jews. But Jesus took the opportunity to show that mercy and compassion are more important than the law they considered divine. Another notable healing occurs in a woman who had suffered from continuous menstrual bleeding for 12 years and was therefore considered unclean. She is healed when she just touches Jesus' robe, as seen in Matthew 9, 20-22, Mark 5, 25-34, and Luke 8, 42-48. Likewise, he heals a mute man in Matthew 9, from 32-34, a deaf man in Mark 7, from 31 to 37, and a man afflicted with his body greatly swollen in Luke 14, from 1 to 6. And in a show of true compassion, he performs his last healing by repairing the ear of one of the men who came to arrest him when one of his disciples cut it off in Luke 22, 50 to 51, hours before his crucifixion. Raising the Dead While Jesus' miracles of healing are great examples of his power as the Son of God, no miracle serves to show his authority over life and death more than the resurrection of the dead. Jesus rarely performs this miracle, but the effect helps to foreshadow his own return from the dead after his crucifixion. Luke 7, 11-17, presents the account of Jesus raising a widow's son from the dead as his coffin was being carried out of his house. Not only does this show Jesus' triumph over death, but it establishes him for the people of Judea as part of a long legacy of miraculous figures, for the resurrection of the widow's son echoes a miracle performed by the prophet Elijah centuries earlier. Likewise, in another passage of the Bible, he raises the daughter of Jairus, one of the temple officials, saying, she is not dead, but only sleeping, to show that death is a temporary condition in the face of the afterlife. This passage is described in Matthew 9, from 18 to 26, Mark 5, from 21 to 43, and Luke 8, from 40 to 56. Jesus' most famous resurrection, besides his own, of course, was that of his friend Lazarus, brother of his followers Mary and Martha of Bethany. The account in John 11, from 1 to 46, includes a very remarkable verse, the shortest in the Bible, where it just says, Jesus wept, showing Jesus' reaction to seeing his fallen friend. Upon being challenged in his request to open his friend's tomb, Jesus tells Martha, sister of Lazarus, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even if he dies, he will live, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. 
Jesus brings Lazarus back to life after he has been dead for four days. Multiplying the fish It wasn't just healing the sick that Jesus showed power with his miracles. Since many of Jesus' followers were fishermen, it is not surprising that several of his demonstrations of power over nature involved the waters of the Sea of Galilee. The account in Luke 5, 1-11, shows Jesus recruiting his first disciples, Simon Peter, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. When he tells them to cast their nets in the water after a long and fruitless day of fishing, the three, skeptical, grudgingly do as he says, and are surprised to catch so many fish that two boats could hardly hold them without tipping over. It is at this moment that Jesus says to follow him and become not fishers of fish, but fishers of men, a beautiful passage in the Gospel of Jesus. The Gospel of John also records a miraculous catch of fish, but whereas the version in Luke takes place very early in Jesus' ministry, the one in John 21, 4 to 11, takes place very late, after Jesus' resurrection, before his ascension, to the heavens. In this case, he helps the disciples to catch a large number of fish to prove that it was he who was there. Money in a fish's mouth While many of Jesus' miracles are well known to the point of becoming proverbial expressions, here is a miracle you may not have heard of. In Matthew 17, from 24 to 27, Jesus and his disciples are in the city of Capernaum when they are approached by tax collectors asking for twice the tax that was paid by the Jews for the maintenance of the temple, an amount equivalent to two sheep. Jesus says that as children of God they should be exempt from the tax, but in order not to cause trouble they would pay it. Jesus then says to Peter, go to the sea and cast a hook. Take the first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you will find a four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them, to pay my tax and yours. By doing exactly what the master said, Peter was surprised to find in the mouth of the fish he caught a large coin worth enough to pay the tax charged. Jesus teaches us with this occasion that we don't need to offend someone unnecessarily, even if they are right, because we should always reflect on the advantages of entering into a conflict. Likewise, helping Peter catch the right fish shows his power over all of creation, Calming the storm Another demonstration of Jesus' power over the elements of nature occurs when he and his disciples are in a boat that is hit by a violent storm, a passage shown in Matthew 8, from 23 to 27, Mark 4, from 35 to 41, and Luke 8, from 22 to 25. While the disciples are afraid that the storm will sink the ship, Jesus is sleeping peacefully below deck. When the startled disciples wake him, scared for their lives, Jesus tells them not to worry and calms the storm. This causes his followers to marvel at the fact that even the winds and the sea obey him. This particular miracle would have great significance for Jesus' Jewish disciples. The Hebrew scriptures, including the Psalms, make it very clear that only God has the power to control the wind and the waves of the sea. For Jesus' disciples, calming the storm was a powerful declaration and concrete confirmation of his divinity. Feeding the crowds Although Jesus' numerous miracles are recorded in more than one of the Gospels, there is one that appears in all four. This miracle is the famous feeding of thousands of people, reported in Matthew 14, from 13 to 21, Mark 6, from 30 to 44, Luke 9, from 10 to 17, and John 6, from 1 to 15. 
In the various accounts of this miracle, Jesus gathered a huge crowd who started to follow him to learn more about his teachings. When Jesus tells his disciples to feed the people who have gathered, they reply that the only food they have is five loaves and two fish. Jesus blesses this small offering, and when it is distributed, it is enough for 5,000 men, plus women and children, with 12 baskets left over. The next day, when this crowd of followers ask him to feed them again, Jesus' stern response shows that his miracles are designed to meet the people's spiritual needs, not their physical ones, and that they were ignoring the meaning of the miracle in the quest to easily get a free meal. While most people are quite familiar with the account of feeding the 5,000, few people remember that Jesus performed basically the same miracle again with a crowd of 4,000 and a slightly different amount of bread and fish, according to Matthew 15, from 32 to 39 and Mark 8, from 1 to 13. Walking on Water In three of the four Gospels, one of Jesus' most famous miracles is reported, walking on water. In Matthew 14, from 22 to 33, Mark 6, from 45 to 52, and John 6, from 16 to 21, the disciples get into a boat after the miracle of multiplication, while Jesus stayed on dry land to pray. Suddenly, the disciples see a figure approaching the boat, walking on the waves, and they think it is a ghost, and they are terrified. But Jesus identifies himself, and tells them not to be afraid. In the Gospel of Matthew, Peter also decides to walk on water to meet his master, and he says, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on top of the water. Jesus then tells him to go ahead. At first, Peter's faith allows him to step into the sea but soon he becomes afraid of the wind and begins to sink, until he is saved by Jesus, who rebukes him for his lack of faith, saying, O oh man of little faith, why did you doubt? The wind then stops, showing once again the great power Jesus had over the elements of nature. Cursing the Fig Tree One of Jesus' last miracles is also one of the strangest. The accounts in Matthew 21, 18 to 22, and Mark 11, 12 to 14, tell of Jesus, hungry, approaching a fig tree in search of fruit. When he finds nothing but leaves on the tree, he curses the tree to never bear fruit again. When the disciples saw the tree again, it had completely dried up. When the disciples ask how Jesus was able to do that, he explains that the power of faith will enable them to do that and much more. Scholars have debated for centuries the significance of Jesus cursing the tree. Was he just hungry? Did Jesus have a mean moment, or is there a greater symbolic meaning? The most widely accepted hypothesis is that the tree represents the Jews and Jesus' frustration with his people's failure to follow God's will. The juxtaposition of the fig tree story alongside Jesus' violent attack on the merchants in the temple seems to lend credence to this interpretation. In this video we detail the miracles of Jesus narrated in the Gospels. If you know others, write in the comments. Also, be sure to give your impressions and suggestions to the channel, always remembering to like and share this video with your friends. And don't miss the next video on the channel, with another mysterious curiosity. Until the next video of Mysteries of the Unknown.